All righty. Uh, apologies in advance that this one might get a little bit long. Uh, I've got about 21 slides to get through. I've had a lot of questions and a lot of uh, conversations in the comment sections uh, about refraction. Uh, I also have uh, Dr. John D's uh, response to me to respond to. Uh, and his uh, basic premise is that uh, between zero and 15 meters above sea level, uh, under normal conditions, the light will refract upwards. Uh, in other words, there will be a uh, density gradient inversion. So let's have a look at what our atmosphere actually looks like. Uh, we'll start at the bottom here at sea level, uh, where the pressure is usually between about 99 kilopascals uh, and 103 kilopascals, uh, and they've set arbitrarily, I guess, uh, the standard to be 101.325 kilopascals, uh, and that the surface temperature is generally around about 15 degrees across the globe. Uh, so under those conditions, the, the density of air uh, is around 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, if we're in a plane or something at about uh, 33,000 feet or 10,000 meters, uh, the pressure is approximately 26% uh, of its value at sea level. Uh, and it gets quite cold up there. Um, temperature generally around about minus 50 degrees uh, outside the plane. Uh, and because the pressure is lower, uh, the air density uh, is only about 0.41 kilograms per cubic meter. All right, so these are actual values from the, uh, the US standard atmosphere. Uh, so as you saw, zero uh, elevation, 15 degrees, uh, 10 hectopascals, uh, and the air density of 1.225 kilos, and up at 10,000 meters, uh, those figures there. So minus 50 degrees, uh, about 26% of normal pressure, uh, and 413.5 uh, grams uh, per cubic meter of air. All right, and it is, Fucking cold up there. Uh, you've probably heard about guys uh, stowing away in the uh, the wheel wells of planes and, and basically freezing to death and, and falling out. Um, and they probably couldn't breathe either. So yeah, not a good way to go. Uh, anyway, uh, so Dr. John uh, in his video took issue with me uh, simplifying the ideal gas law. He's a, he's a bit of a uh, sensitive little flower. Uh, but anyway, here is how and why I uh, simplified the ideal gas law. Uh, so I've taken this formula. It's basically a restatement uh, of the ideal gas law in uh, terms that are helpful. Uh, so I've got pressure equals density times the specific gas constant uh, times T for temperature. And all I've done here is flipped it around. Uh, then here I have divided by T, which is the temperature. Uh, so I've got the density times the gas constant equals pressure over temperature. Uh, and then when we use this formula, I don't actually care what the constant is because I'm only really concerned with relative changes uh, in, the, in the pressure and temperature. So I just drop that uh, constant uh, and come up with this formula, uh, density equals pressure over temperature. Let's actually do an example to uh, see how this formula works. Uh, so at sea level, uh, the pressure is 101.325 kilopascals, uh, but at 10,000 meters altitude, the air pressure is only about 26% uh, of the pressure at sea level. Um, let's do temperature now. Uh, so the temperature at the surface is about 15 degrees Celsius or 288 degrees Kelvin, uh, but at 10,000 meters, it actually falls to about minus 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that's a change of 65 degrees Celsius over 10,000 meters. Uh, and that's what we call a lapse rate. Uh, and in this case, it's 6.5 degrees per kilometer um, or 0 0.0065 degrees per meter. Uh, so again, in relative terms, uh, the temperature at that altitude uh, is only about 77% of the temperature at sea level. Uh, so if we apply both those relative changes to our formula, uh, the pressure is only 26% of what it was, uh, and the temperature is only 77% of what it was. Uh, that should mean that the density of air is only about 34% of what it was. Uh, and if you check the US standard atmosphere, uh, that works out. So this number here is roughly 34% of that number there. All right, so let's do another example. Uh, but in this example, we are going to manipulate the temperature uh, in order to keep the density uh, uniform, basically the same throughout. 
So again, at sea level, uh, our pressure is 101.325, uh, but at 1,000 meters, the air pressure is 89.88 kilopascals. So again, a relative change, uh, the air pressure is only about 88.7% of the pressure at sea level. Uh, right, so if we want to keep the density the same, then we need to match that change in pressure with a change in temperature. Uh, so 88.7% of the temperature at sea level, uh, 288.15 Kelvin, uh, would take us to 255 degrees Kelvin or minus 18 degrees. So you can see that we've changed the temperature by 33 degrees over that 1000 meters, which is a lot. Uh, and that equates to 0 0.033 Kelvin uh, per meter. And that's basically what I calculated uh, in my previous video, uh, where I explained the 7 over 6 uh, effective earth radius multiplier uh, that metabunk.org uses in their curve calculator. All right, but the standard atmosphere uh, has a lapse rate of only 0 0.0065 degrees Kelvin per meter. Uh, and that's an order of magnitude less than what's required to keep the density the same. So what we take from that uh, is that under normal conditions, under this lapse rate, uh, the air at the surface is certainly much more dense than the air higher up. Uh, and that will be a normal downwardly refracting density gradient. All right, so back to uh, Dr. John's uh, response to me. And he's actually laid out some of the influences or the factors that go into refraction. So he's got them all correct. Uh, when the temperature decreases and all other factors stay the same, uh, then the density increases. Uh, when the water vapor or relative humidity increases, the density decreases. Uh, and as you gain altitude, uh, the density decreases. All right, so let's look at those factors uh, into what makes an index of refraction. And to do that, we're actually going to uh, borrow some formulas uh, from this paper called Refractive Index of Air, New Equations for the Visible and Near Infrared um, by this guy, Philip Sidor, in 1996. Uh, and basically, they use some pretty high-tech lab equipment uh, to measure the index of refraction under various conditions. Uh, and they can do that very, very accurately. So you can see here, uh, the accuracy is one part in 10 to the power of eight, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and if you visit this guy, uh, what's his name? Mikhail Polyansky or something. Uh, he's actually translated these formulas that Philip Sidor has derived uh, and put them into a Python script, which I have downloaded uh, and used. Right, so let's have a look at how influential the, the water vapor or relative humidity is in that equation. Uh, and there are five inputs to the equation. Uh, I have set the wavelength of light to be 560 nanometers, which is roughly in the middle of the visible spectrum. Uh, I've set the temperature to be about 11 degrees, uh, which is what Dr. John measured at Brighton Pier. Uh, I've kept the pressure at the standard 101.325 kilopascals. Uh, relative humidity I've sent to, set to 75%, which is roughly what Dr. John measured. Uh, and the carbon dioxide concentration I've kept at 410 parts per million because I have no idea really what to put in there. Uh, and this is a fairly typical looking uh, index of refraction. Uh, so it's usually one followed by roughly three zeros uh, and then some more numbers. Uh, 281.19. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, change the elevation. So we're going to go up, going to go up 15 meters uh, and calculate a new air pressure at that elevation. Uh, and that works out to be 101, uh, 142. Uh, so again, plugging that uh, pressure into the formula, uh, we get a new index of refraction. So 1.000280. Now, what we're going to do now is uh, try to counteract that change in pressure by decreasing the relative humidity. So basically we're gonna keep wavelength, temperature, and carbon dioxide concentration the same, uh, but plug in a, a new value for relative humidity to counteract uh, the change uh, in the refractive index due to the change in pressure. So what number do we have to plug in uh, for relative humidity to get it back up to this uh, 281.19? Well, bow bow, even if you plug in a relative humidity of 0%, uh, it is still not enough uh, to bump that 
uh, index of refraction up enough to get back to where we were uh, to counteract uh, the change in refractive index due to the change in pressure. Uh, so from that we can conclude that uh, water vapor and or relative humidity uh, is has a fairly negligible effect uh, on the index of refraction. So let's have a look at how influential the, the wavelength is uh, on the formula. All right, so let's have a look at blue light. Uh, so I've plugged in a uh, wavelength of 380 nanometers, uh, temperature of 11 degrees, normal air pressure, relative humidity at 75% and a normal CO2 concentration. Uh, and this is the index of refraction that it spits out. Uh, so let's compare that to the red end of the spectrum. So in this case, I've plugged in uh, 740 nanometers for the wavelength uh, and kept all the other parameters the same. And it comes out at quite a different, uh, quite a different value. Uh, and if you look at the refractivity, so instead of the, the index of refraction, uh, the refractivity is basically the index of refraction minus one. So this part, the zero part. Uh, those numbers are actually 3% different, and that's huge. Uh, but what does it mean for curving of light around the Earth's surface? Absolutely fucking nothing. But why? And it's because refraction is all about a change in density. So the density gradient, that is what matters. So think back to the inputs uh, to the refraction formula. You had wavelength, temperature, pressure, humidity and CO2 concentration. And think about which of these inputs can change between the light leaving the object that you're looking at and hitting your eye. Uh, so unless the object is you know, moving away from you at a uh, significant percentage of the speed of light, uh, the wavelength does not change. But you can see changes in temperature, pressure, humidity, and even CO2 concentration. Right, so let's do the maths just to, to make sure that what I'm saying is correct. Uh, so on the left here, uh, I have uh, got the index of refraction for the blue light uh, at 15 meters elevation uh, and also at uh, sea level. And on the right hand side, I've done the numbers for red light at 740 nanometers at 15 meters and also at sea level. And if you know anything about refraction, uh, you know that uh, the amount or the angle that the light will bend depends on the ratio of these two numbers. Uh, and if you look at uh, the change in these two numbers, so this is 52 parts uh, in 10 to the power of eight, and this is 50 parts uh, in 10 to the power of eight, they are basically identical. So whether it's blue light or red light, uh, they will both bend the same amount. Right, so the summary so far, we've worked out that relative humidity has a negligible effect. Uh, we've worked out that wavelength has basically no effect. Uh, and as, as yet, no one's claiming that CO2 concentration uh, has a, a significant effect on refraction. Uh, so the only two factors left are temperature and pressure. Right, so let's apply all this to uh, Dr. John's observation from Worthing Pier across to Brighton uh, and trying to figure out whether he has an upwardly refracting uh, inverted density gradient or whether he has a normal downwardly uh, refracting density gradient. And given that we've ruled out uh, relative humidity and uh, wavelength as factors in that, the only real drivers of uh, atmospheric refraction are temperature and pressure. Uh, so let's see what lapse rate he needs, so what change in temperature he needs to counteract uh, the effect on refraction that the pressure has. Right, so at sea level, uh, the air pressure is the standard 101325, uh, and at 15 meters, we calculate an air pressure of 101142. So in relative terms, uh, the pressure has decreased by 0.18%. His measurements that he made at uh, Worthing Pier were roughly around 11 degrees Celsius, uh, one or two meters above the ground. Uh, so for the density to remain the same, uh, the temperature at 15 meters elevation also needs to decrease by the same 0.18%, uh, and that is approximately 0.5 degrees Kelvin or 0.5 degrees Celsius either way. Uh, and this is where it gets tricky. Uh, did he actually sort of use up 
that half a degree uh, in the first meter or two. Uh, if he did, uh, then he would have an upwardly refracting gradient in the first couple of meters. Uh, but then after that, where the, the temperature doesn't really change, uh, he would have a normal downwardly refracting gradient. Uh, there's also the question of, you know, whether the water that's close to the shore is warmer than the water further out. Uh, and that would mean that uh, for the majority of the path of that light, uh, there would be cool water and warm air, uh, which would be a normal downwardly refracting gradient. So in conclusion, the lapse rate so the change in temperature with respect to elevation close to the surface of the water is really variable. And it's basically impossible to measure accurately. Uh, so the, the density gradient that you get may or may not be inverted. And that means you may or may not get inferior mirages. Uh, if you are close to the surface, you'll also get waves. Uh, you might make small errors in your observer height and those errors are magnified. So my advice is to not even bother making observations so close to the surface. You know, get, get high, uh, that means get some elevation, uh, and look at something a long way away, like a mountain uh, with a lot of uh, refracted hidden. Uh, and unless you can demonstrate that the atmosphere you're looking through is all the same density, uh, which it basically never is, then don't ignore refraction. The end.